Good day, everyone, and welcome to Neem Capsule, a uh, fresh podcast on New Foundation. And uh, today is the 4th of November, 2022. And I'm um, Adedoyin Betiko um, here at Neem Foundation. I have three amazing guests here in the studio with us, and um, we're going to be talking about fake news. And um, before I go into it, I'll uh, allow my guests to introduce themselves, and um, we'll start with my right. Hello, everyone. I'm Belsuk Tabgun Ali Mikena. I am a gender advocate and gender specialist. All right. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, the the <laughs> guy in the, <laughs> the other guy in the room. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, in the first edition of. Uh, this podcast of Neem Capsule. Uh, my name is Ahmed Jumari. I'm a strategic communications expert. Nice to be with you. All right. Thank you very much for coming, Ahmed. And Hello, everybody. I'm Chinyarugo Nyekwe. I'm a clinical psychologist, and it's good to be here. Thank you so much. I'm from the resume. <laughs> you can tell that it's a full house. We'll be talking about... Um, fake news in terms of security, gender, and mental health. Um, we're, we are aware of what fake news is. It's nothing new, especially in this part of the world. Um, I'd like to just quickly draw our minds back to Ebola, uh, when people were told to um, bathe with salt. Mm. And there were many, many casualties in the um, hospitals. And we see that fake news can um, go beyond just, ah, it's a joke, um, to real-world impact. Um, I'll start with uh, Ahmed <laughs> on the security aspect. Um, I'm, I'm sure that with the elections around the corner, um, economic um, um, turmoil here and there, there's a lot of fake news going around on social media, even on traditional media. And um, one would think that, um, you know, the news agencies would maybe take their time to process. But in this day and age where news needs to fly fast, you know, um, there's quite a lot going on. So in the past two years, how has fake news impacted our national security, Ahmed? Thank you very much, uh, Adi Doing. I, th I think there's a lot to pack into that uh, one question. I think firstly, just to admit uh, and acknowledge that fake news remains uh, one of the biggest challenges we have as a country. Um, of course, even when you start to uh, disintegrate uh, uh, fake news and, and, and at different levels uh, and, and uh, really look how at, uh, at how they're applied uh, at various fronts, um, perhaps it, it will give you a, a better picture of how uh, this affects our national security. So for instance, some of the biggest issues we're seeing as it relates to fake news uh, being delivered in Nigeria is on three fronts. Uh, you have uh, fake news that comes in form of misinformation. And oftentimes, uh, this happens in a context where people innocently share uh, information that is unverified. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I remember just last week we had an incident where someone shared uh, an, an information uh, uh, to a colleague about an attack happening in, in this city that were in Abuja. Um, of course, uh, before the veri verification happened, and Belsuk, I'm sure, will be laughing because she was also aware of this news. Um, what, what really happened is that uh, panic set in, hmm. right? This wasn't true, but because of the, 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 the importance of that information, that person felt they need to share it. Uh, so sometimes uh, unverified information that is innocently shared can also be uh, a problem. Uh, we have, uh, in some instances, disinformation. Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky. For disinformation, we see it uh, being deliberately shared um, across our space. We've seen it on social media. We've seen it even, uh, unfortunately, in our mainstream media, where, uh, for instance, uh, uh, certain information is shared deliberately to cause chaos amongst uh, communities. So that's... Uh, in most cases, what we see uh, in the context of disinformation. Now, there's another element that we're now seeing more frequently uh, in the Nigerian space, especially now uh, that we've seen conflicts in, in virtually every region in the country. Uh, it's called malinformation, right? Now, malinformation is where you have uh, some truth um, mm. that you want to share, 
but because you want to cause uh, chaos or you want to achieve a personal end, you exaggerate the news. So, for instance, uh, Chini, <laughs> that's right next to me here, um, uh, maybe we get into an argument and Chini shouts at me. Now, what would happen then if Belsu goes out and says, oh, there was a fight uh, during the podcast. Mm. Uh, Chini shouted at Ahmed, she slapped him, you know, she punched him, she even shot him in the leg, you know, so it can get uh, even that gruesome uh, sometimes with malinformation. So these are some of the levels we're seeing. Um, but now with the upcoming elections, uh, of course, uh, being held uh, in, in probably one of the most troubling times in the country, uh, we have uh, conflicts in the northwest and northeast, the insurgencies and, and banditry that's going on uh, in the southwest and southeast. We're seeing some levels of um, successionist activities going on, uh, as well as various other challenges like uh, the oil bunkering that we're seeing. Uh, now, when you put this coupled with the various levels of uh, fake news and misinformation we're seeing, it makes for a very dangerous cocktail. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there are things uh, that are being done uh, to to manage this, and we'll get to that, I'm sure, at some point in this discussion. Thank you. Definitely. Everybody. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, social media can be a very, very tricky place, and we see that um, there's almost no end to the kind of chaos that can be caused by fake news, misinformation, um, disinformation, and malinformation, like you said. And one of our major focal points here at NIMI Foundation is gender equality, gender equity, and ensuring that um, the gender space is um, balanced and fair for all. Um, I'm sure that, Belsok, um, and this question is for you, I'm sure that in the um, progress that we've made so far, not just as NIME alone, but um, in the gender rights movement um, in Nigeria, there has been some sort of um, misinformation, disinformation that has sort of set back the, the progress that has been made so far. Um, in the fight against GBV, to what extent has fake news and misinformation or disinformation or malinformation um, been a limiting factor? Um, thank you very much, Doyin. Um, so I think, of course, we know that information, as Ahmed just says, can lead to chaos. Um, misinformation, more importantly, can lead to chaos. Um, so I think in the fight against GBV particularly, it has meant that um, an area that is already not being fought enough against in terms of people getting justice and people getting access to um, services, etc. It has actually just pushed the fight back, I think, <laughs> a million years mm -hmm. um, because it's in the kind of society we're in, it's already hard enough um, for victims or survivors to be able to get justice for um, crimes against them. However, now with the misinformation and we really don't know anymore what is true um, and what isn't true. So even those that are true, like the boy who cried wolf, now you're not quite sure what is true mm -hmm. and what isn't true out there. So um, it's really pushed the fight back um, a long way because already, as I said, women were already cautious about going to report cases. But now because even the authorities um, put out information which may not necessarily be accurate. So it also deters victims from going to report um, um, cases of GBV mm -hmm. against them. Um, and I think it just serves really to silence voices more as we move forward, silence the voices of survivors. And ultimately, it um, precludes their access to justice because they don't feel safe anymore taking the necessary steps. Yeah. Um, in Africa, um, specifically, I think the misinformation, disinformation has just, probably all over the world, has actually now introduced more forms mm -hmm. of GBV because you now have um, online bullying, you have sexual harassment, you have image-based image, image -based sexual violence, amongst others. So it's actually just amplified the problem and limited um, people's um, assurance that they will get justice yeah. moving forward. Yeah, I like where you stopped. And um, I think it's going to be a two-pronged um, question for both Belsuk and Chini. So I'll still stay on you, Belsuk. Okay. Um, 
what would compel people to believe and act on um, fake news? Because you need to, <laughs> and maybe I ask um, uh, uh, Chini this question, you need to be in a certain mindset for you to create or want to um, share fake news, especially for people who know that this is fake news and they're deliberately sharing it or creating it, maybe to create chaos or stuff. What do you think compels people to both um, believe and act on um, I, I want to lean towards not, I don't want to say a lack of education, but a lack of critical thinking, mm. I think, because if you get information, you can sit down and say, is it possible that this could have happened? But some, a lot of people don't ask that question. And of course, in this social media age we're in, it's so easy just to pass around information without w waiting to verify where did it come from. There are so many blogs. There are so many places you can get information. So if I trust a specific blog online and they post something, I'll be like, no, nah, it must be true because mm -hmm. they posted it. And then you're quick to, to spread the news. And of course, our society being very pa patriot patriarchal, you know the mm -hmm. word I mean, as it is, people are going to believe whatever they read, particularly yeah. about women. And unfortunately for us, we never believe that, okay, this man committed this crime. It is usually this woman was dressed this way. Mm. This is why the crime was yeah. committed. So I also put a lot of onus on our media people in how they actually present this information mm. because the information is usually somewhere in that news. It will say she was wearing a short skirt or mm. she was out at night or something along those lines. So the... We really need to also sensitize our media as to how they, you know, put out this information. Don't focus on the victim or what the victim was wearing or how she looked or whatever it is. They need to focus more on the on the perpetrator, mm. because I find that when it's focused on the woman, it's easy to share it around and say, eh, you see, you see, why, why was she even there mm -hmm. at this time of night? You don't yeah. take time to check whether she was really there, maybe she went to buy bread, maybe she, but people are so quick to, you know, share negative information, I think. Mm -hmm. That just makes it and easier. And even if she was there at an odd time, it's still no excuse for that kind of um, uh, um, behavior. Exactly. I'm going to come to you, Chini. Um, what are some of the psychological um, factors that could um, lead people into creating and spreading fake news and misinformation? Um, so when I, when I was like, um, trying to read, do like a lot of reading and research on this. Unfortunately, no one really comes to therapy um, for creating or spreading fake news. So you have to um, look for data to help you with the conversation. Um, you know, statistics and research out there shows that people don't intentionally um, spread fake news. And it gets you thinking, so why is there fake news everywhere? Um, has it always been there? But I think one of the first things I, I noticed is we're living in a society also that has become very paranoid. Um, just key words already trigger people and fear um, is one of those factors that push people into sharing information. Um, and when people get information, they don't even think, the first thing they think is, oh my goodness, safety, I have to share this, I have to let people know this is going to happen, or you know, they need to know this information, and they just push out content that is not real. They don't sit to verify, maybe they've picked like a few words here and there, and they've shared it. So I find that the first time, at first, it's usually fear, or one of the first things that makes people do that, is like an element of fear, anxiety. Um, a lot of the times we get this information that can also lead us into a place of panic, a state of panic, um, that also makes us just say share 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 and then we just move it along before we take time to sit back like Belsuk said and critically think about what has been said and you know is it true the damage has been done because we've sent the information out there then on the other hand there are people who intentionally um, just go out of their way to share it I might mention that sometimes it's also like a tool used to cause chaos so it's intentional so there's an element of control there's an element of wanting to change the environment, wanting to change people's mindset or wanting to achieve a goal through sharing that. So it's always intentional. Um, I wouldn't necessarily look at any psychological diagnosis off of that, but I'll say a lot of the times it's a mind game that we might, might be also playing on other people, um, you know, taking advantage of the fear that is already in existence, taking advantage of the fact that 
because people get worried so much and because people depend on information that they receive and information is out there, it's everywhere, everything is news, everything is information, and we take advantage of that and we try to cause more harm and then use news to also share good information. Then on the other, t- on the other hand, fake news can also be shared when there's like a good fake news, mm. if there's anything like that. So um, you see that a lot of the younger people sharing content about a lifestyle that is not true. Mm. So it's not necessarily that it's, it's fearful or anything. It's just sometimes we find that with the young people, the content they put out there about maybe their life or people is really not what it is. And then it also boils down to the need for, um, the need to show off, the need for identity, the comparison that lots of young people are dealing with now. And a lot of the times we can begin to talk about things like, um, what is this nice word we like to use? Complex. Mm. Um, we can begin to talk about those things that people feel the need to put out a certain information or a certain image to make themselves feel good, mm. or maybe to cover up a lie um, and just you know project themselves to a way that it's not um, where it is. So it's always about the why, you know, like we're talking about understanding the intentions too. Sometimes good or bad, the news is still fake. The information yeah. is still fake. Yeah. It's, it's like why, you know, and. That, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Chini. Um, Ahmed, I'm going to come to you and uh, from the securities perspective. Um, with the prevalence of um, fake news um, in our social space, how do we even begin to identify, verify, and then um, tackle a spread? I know Biasuka talked about, Biasuka and Chini have talked about critical thinking, but I mean, is that enough in itself? Um, how do we identify, how do we know that, okay, this might be fake news, um, especially things that are maybe time-bound, for instance. How do I quickly process all of that within the short span um, before I'm able to act or not act on it? Um, thank you very much, Edidu. I think this this was really incredible. It's, it's nice to hear um, all these inputs from, from Chini and Balsuk. But really, they hammered on, on key issues. Uh, critical thinking is important. Um, I, I think Belsuk mentioned on, uh, you know, a part of sensitization for the media. I think it's also uh, very key. Um, in the past, we've seen uh, a lot of organizations uh, in Nigeria, including the EU. Uh, uh, we've seen trainings uh, done uh, by the UN, as well as also the DFID and the federal government themselves uh, uh, on conflict-sensitive uh, media management. Uh, especially as, as uh, you know, the, th- the, the media practitioners are, are members of the third realm. Uh, essentially, their role is to really serve as gatekeepers to ensure that the information that gets out there is actually verified. Uh, where it's not, is is provided in a way that uh, communities can digest it using critical thinking that was just mentioned. Uh, but of course, there's some things that, that have been done. Um, uh, just, I think, last week or the week before, uh, the the Abu- Abuja Declaration was signed uh, by UNESCO. Uh, this was a concerted effort by about 65 countries uh, to adopt uh, a, 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 a policy, or, or if be it a declaration on uh, funding and financing for for media and information literacy. Uh, the entire almost most of the objective of this uh, declaration is to ensure that. Uh, those uh, uh, capacities needed to be built to understand and manage fake news, disinformation, misinformation uh, is being provided uh, at a global level. Now, um, as individuals, uh, as as communities, as organizations, there are some things we can do. Uh, For instance, at the moment we see uh, any information, first thing that should go to your head is the source. Mm. Uh, is the source credible? Um, I know for a fact I've had friends in the past that will share information that, in fact, at every point, I have a friend that, um, uh, Ibrahim, I hope you're not listening to this podcast, but <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you are, I, I will use you as an example. Now, Ibrahim, almost on a weekly basis, shares information with me. He, he, you could hear, for instance, it ranges from uh, Nigeria has started uh, production of 80% of Mercedes-Benz, or you mm-hmm. could even hear information such as uh, maybe a certain state in Nigeria uh, is underwater. Now, mm-hmm. some of these things could be, I mean, have elements of truth in it, but because 
that particular source has proven Ibrahim again, sorry, <laughs> has proven not to be credible. Um, I, I always make sure I double check when, when Ibrahim sends me information. Now, another way you can also check me to, is who else is sharing it, right? So, I mean, over time, even at community level, in fact, even before the advent of social media, you find that as a society grows, uh, it's easy to, to understand who uh, is credible, who is not, who provides accurate information, who doesn't. Uh, so those sorts of people also sharing content could be looked at, or organizations in some cases, as sources to verify news. Uh, I mean, you could perhaps even look at um, uh, maybe a news coming out from a small outlet, maybe called textile media that puts out information. You've never heard of them. Now, you look at agencies like BBC, uh, AFP, Reuters, Al Jazeera, you know, those those are organizations that verify news before they go out. Have they shared anything on that, mm. right? Uh, another way you can also look at it is evidence uh, and images, right? Uh, it could be audiovisual. Uh, so there are instances where in the past people share fake news, but they attach it with content that make it makes it look real. Yes. So in the conflict uh, in the Northeast, for instance, the Boko Haram context, we've seen and even to some extent the Northwest in some states, we've seen a lot of fake news that was shared uh, using content from other countries as evidence. So for instance, in Nigeria, we've seen uh, content shared from conflict areas in Cameroon. We've mm -hmm. seen content from conflict areas in Chad, Sudan, different parts of Africa that were represented as issues happening in Nigeria. And in some cases, in fact, just in the past two years, I think there were so many communal clashes, as well as also ethno-religious tensions that were caused because of that misrepresentation of information. Uh, then finally, one of the things that really uh, you can look at as well as you go uh, uh, to analyze it is intuition, mm. right? Uh, I mean, as human beings, there are certain instincts that we have to understand uh, what's true and what's not. Sometimes it's not always accurate. But if you see an information that sounds too good to be true, question it. Because oftentimes, especially in the context we live in, the Nigeria of today, that could mean life or death for mm -hmm. a lot of society. Mm -hmm. So that's where we always advise a lot of caution in the way information is shared, managed, and also understood. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I really like the way you broke it down um, in terms of the, the, the source, the history, the, hev the evidence as well. Um, that was really, really good. Um, Belsuk, I mean, it's Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We are um, majorly youths, and uh, youthful exuberance comes to play sometimes. But um, outside that, do you think our social traditional system, in one way or another, contributes to the spread of fake news or the easy spread of fake news? Absolutely. Absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, because of how women have always been viewed in the Nigerian society, it's very easy to spread any fake information about a young lady or about something that happened to her and everybody would believe it. Um, and as you said, we have a lot of youths, we have a lot of young people who may take a picture of a young lady, maybe having her bath or whatever it is, share the picture and say she was on her way to do something. It's easy to believe, maybe mm -hmm. because people already have, mainly maybe in university or something, because people already believe all oh, university girls are, are, are wayward or whatever it is, especially if you're in certain parts of the country. So I think definitely the society we're in um, doesn't help in that. Um, and I think that the in our particular setting, the disinformation or misinformation, or whatever we want to call it, actually dangerously promotes um, or incubates rape apology. Mm -hmm. And it's actually promoting a vicious cycle of sexual and gender-based violence mm -hmm. um, because it's normalizing a culture of silence, reinforcing victim blaming and shaming like we mentioned earlier it's always going to be the victim's fault no matter what she does mm -hmm. it's always going to be the victim's fault and you know this because if you tell somebody something like i said they would, the first thing they'll say is what was she even doing mm. there? why was she even wearing this so the society believes 
because of, you know, gender differences or gender roles, okay, a man can be in a club to all hours, but a woman can or should not. Let me not say cannot, should not. So I think our society has really made it easy for us to be able to push those false narratives and have people believe them. Mm. Um, and so I think we really need to find a way to change to change some of those um, narratives. We've all mentioned here about actually verifying information, checking the source of the information, where did this information actually come from? And there needs to be some lev- some kind of repercussion or some level of accountability mm-hmm. for, I don't know how we'll ever find the source, um, mm-hmm. but I'm sure technology has come a long way. Mm-hmm. There should definitely be a way of finding the source of this misinformation. I know in the Western world, definitely people get charged and get jailed for putting out information um, that was false. We saw it recently with the case of... Um, can I say the celebrities' names? <laughs> a, cept- a certain captain mm-hmm. <laughs> and car- Pirates of the Caribbean and yeah. his, you know, his ex-wife. Mm-hmm. But on, although that was, you know, vice versa, but yeah. initially people believed mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. immediately. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the victim also has a role to play in how much of this is believed. If we, ke- Like I mentioned, if we keep crying wolf, it's going to get to a point that nobody believes. It'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Absolutely. Um, in the game of um, what, there's a, a, a card that is called general market. Mm-hmm. So this is the general <laughs> market question. <laughs> um, do we agree that tweaking the truth, the absolute truth in any way is mis- or m- disinformation? Or misinformation? Do we agree? What is the truth? So if the truth is A, B, C... Mm-hmm. And and you say just A. Mm. Is it still true? No, it's not. Mm. No, so may, maybe maybe I can come in here. Yes, I, I did doing a, a, a <laughs> very famous <laughs> one. Um, so I mean, this is not a yes or no answer. Mm. Um, again, uh, you know, even even as a society. Um, you look at the various uh, levels of um, the, the spectrum within the society, right? So at every point within the spectrum, there's information that could be relevant and there's information that could cause tensions. I'll give you an example. Um, if you go down uh, to a society where there's a lot of religious tensions, uh, and uh, perhaps maybe that, uh, that particular night there was an incident involving members from two religious groups. Now, there are members from maybe the Christian faith and Muslim faith that had, had a personal issue between themselves as individuals. Uh, of course, if that information was to be represented by the media as an issue. So when you say there was a fight mm. that led to the killing of someone, and you say it, was, it, it happened from members, one that was Christian and one that was Muslim, now already you framed it in a way that could, could cause conflict. So it's true, but it could cause conflict. So in those instances, what we always encourage, as Cheney and Balsuk have said, is now look at the essential message you're trying to drive. Conflict and violence should be something that the society should not allow. Right? Whether it happens amongst two religions, different ethnic groups, or even individuals that have personal issues, I think it should always be represented with the issue coming first before you allow for any speculation to happen. That being said, now this is a context where information is managed. Mm. Now if information is tweaked, like you said, then it's a problem. Because by virtue of tweaking information, it means that you're providing uh, access to content or information that is completely inaccurate. So, for instance, if, let's say, uh, I go home and I write an exam, and in that exam, uh, for instance, maybe there, there are two subjects that I have to write an exam. In one, I get 98%, right? In another one, I get 40%, right? Which mm-hmm. means I failed, mm-hmm. right? Now, I go home and I tell my parents, oh, mama, look what, I, I passed my exam with flying colors, I got... Uh, 98% in my exam, so now I can I can go to university, something along those lines. Now, you've tweaked the information in a way that deliberately would be 
uh, uh, seen by the person as, as something that's true, but it's not, because you know that it's deliberately tweaked to provide an information that's inaccurate. So that's just an example I was given. And thanks for the trick question. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have something, I have something to add to <laughs> yes, that. Yes. I think my understanding of your question mm -hmm. is not necessarily that the information was tweaked. Some was omitted. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that it was tweaked. In which case, it's not as if you're giving misinformation. For example, if you... I think it boils down again to how the information is being passed, who is coming from. For if maybe a radio presenter or a news person, a newscaster wants to give some information. I don't think if the additional information is going to flare up tempers or increase people's anxiety, fear, etc. I don't feel there's anything wrong in omitting that information. Mm -hmm. If you want to tell me so, so, so scores of people died. I don't necessarily need to hear this is how they died, this is what happened to them, we found this many bodies, this many heads. I know the information, I need to know. Mm -hmm. So as in, even with your marriage now, it's not all information <laughs> you <laughs> give, you find oh, a way to yes. omit <laughs> the part that may hurt the person, may cause more damage, may cause more chaos, as Ahmed mentioned earlier. So I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong in responsibly omitting. <laughs> information. Like so does that now make you <laughs> fake news? <laughs> I like that term, responsibly <laughs> omitting. Mm. And I learned something also, as a single person, uh, <laughs> I would <laughs> we'll visit that later. <laughs> so the reason I asked about that is because so there are certain families or certain groups of people in uh, um, multi-ethnic um, community who believe that news of um say rape for instance is a blemish to their to their family name right and maybe for instance um it had escalated to the police and because they were trying to keep their family name they omitted the fact that the lady or the guy was raped so that's why i was asking if removing some information is in itself fake news. Um, especially when it has to do with maybe removing it just for the protection of something that is held um, dearly. I think it depends why the information is removed. Mm. I think the the um, what's the word I'm what's the word I'm looking for? The intent matters. Mm. So if it was removed to protect an identity, i.e., if you, um, you know, all these shooting sprees in America recently, they won't tell you the name of a 17-year-old mm. that shot the gun. It's for a reason. It's to protect their identity because they are, you may be causing more harm to the person by putting their identity out there. So I think the intent behind it also matters, but it's very hard to determine yeah. someone's intent <laughs> someone's yeah. intent yeah. Um, when they're doing something but of course you know the context we work in the north northeast northwest they're very traditional mm -hmm. um rape gbv is still a topic we are trying to advocate get people to talk about openly but it's a gradual process and some of these family names their cultures etc are more long-standing than this new topic we've introduced to their society. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you also have to look at the context you're working in and what, what works where Absol you are. Absolutely. I'd like to I'd like to also add um yeah. not every information is relevant. Um mm -hmm. and the fact that we have uh, information doesn't necessarily mean that it should be shared. My concern here with also in answering the question and looking at it is when we're sharing information that needs to be shared, if we if we are um if there's false information in that in what we're sharing, then it's fake. So if you are going to a place to talk about, let's say, um, a case of mental health, like I'd like to say, and you are removing, um, you're not adding the person's name or you're not adding the diagnosis, but you are saying that there is, this is the problem or this is the information that is relevant, it doesn't make that information fake. It just means that it's not relevant to that context. Mm -hmm. So I think 
we should also bear in mind that sometimes not every information is relevant, but that the information that is passed on is not false. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. the way I'll see it. So as we wind down um, this conversation, Chini, um, how does fake news impact our mental health? And how can we also protect our mental health, especially with, I mean, it's just going to escalate more yeah. in this coin, the coming days. Yeah. Um, my, I'm supporting a candidate, you're supporting a candidate, I'm going to say some things that I hope to score points, and in scoring points, it might hurt you, right? And because of the things you hold there to you, right, it might then escalate to personal, interpersonal clashes between us. Yeah. Um, how do we protect our mental health um, um, from, you know, these issues. And most especially, or, or before that, um, how do this kind of um, fake news or news in general impact yeah. our mental health? Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the time of COVID. Um, a little in, during the COVID period, like during the lockdown, um, we saw the impact of fake news on people. Um, there was just, I mean, even with the Ebola case that you gave an example of, there was just so much information that you're like, you don't even know what is true and what is not true. So some people ended up just doing everything. And some people died as a result of that. Um, a lot of fear. There was like a shared sense of fear. There was anxiety. There was worry. There was so much stress going on. So when you're sending out fake news, know that you're impacting somebody's health negatively mm -hmm. um for whatever reason you think you're doing it for it's not justified but a lot of the times we are causing harm to people because information is like snap of a button mm -hmm. now in those days you probably wait for the newspaper to be circulated mm -hmm. or the person with the gong to go around the village square inviting everybody but now i can close my eye and open my eye and Twitter has said something. I, you know, information is readily available all the time. Um, and this affects us because we function with information. We need, we need to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting the wrong information, I think it should also be said that you're going to be hurting people by exposing them to things that is not necessary, that they don't need to deal with, and you're going to send them down like a spiral. It was it was really bad in in like in the, the time the, the the beginning time of COVID and the beginning time of Ebola. There was just a lot of confusion, chaos, stress, um, with a lot of people. So it negatively impacted our mental health. Um, and, and some people are still dealing with the consequences of what happened then. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we protect our mental health? Um, especially from the impact, the psychological impact of fake news. Yeah. Um, so because of the way information is spread now, most times you can't, um, it's not as easy as avoid it. Because mm. we'd like to say avoid it. But as much as you can, just ensure that you're not digesting information from unreliable sources. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as not following this page or not following that play page or blocking this number or telling the person who's sharing that WhatsApp message, can you please stop sharing this to me? Oh block the person mm -hmm. um, because some people just I, I think they're just perpetual sharers mm. just share everything you get mm. before even reading it they have shared it um, so it's about also telling the person or informing people how are you smiling are you one of them <laughs> no <laughs> the reason why I'm smiling is because there's one demographic that came to mind our African mm -mm. I won't say anything but yeah please go yeah, ahead um, so it's important to also um, protect your mind as, as much as you can I mean those small things that you can do when information comes that you find that can be scary or frightful, it's also good for you to, in that space, just look for people and places and things that make you feel safe. It could be picking up a phone and calling and say, oh, have you heard this? What's going on? Just for you to also verify it, to give you some some sanity before you um, emotionally respond to it um, because it can be that quick. So it's also about for your own safe, for your own sanity, try to find out um, from people. Just speak to people that can also cheer you up and just take your mind away from that content content that um, that can be very disturbing. Mm -hmm. And remember that when you also verify it, it also brings you know some level of calm and peace to you because you know it's not true. And even if the information that is gone out is true and there is you know there's doom and chaos out there, there's also there are also things that you can do to help protect your mind. Um, just remember that at the end of the day, 
um, you have to do what you have to do to make sure that you're in the right headspace. News is always going to be there. Content is always going to be there. Because of the nature of the way information is spread now, um, you may not be able to just avoid it, but you can always protect your mind and the way you respond to it. Absolutely. I'm also going to add that um, you should be able to um, disconnect from time to time. Um, I remember during the NSAS um, period, I had to, at a point in time, just shut off entirely mm -hmm. because it was really traumatic to see a lot of day in, day out, bad news, yeah. you know, and it's, it just seems like bad news seems to, to sell a lot in, yeah. in this country. Um, as we round up, um, Ahmed, the last question. Um, what is the role of individuals and media stakeholders in regulating banned um, um, regulating and controlling the spread of fake news and misinformation in Nigeria? Perfect. I think, again, they're doing your multi-packed questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so as individuals, I think the, the important thing is just to be vigilant um, alongside the different areas I had um, initially highlighted, verifying the source, uh, also look at who's sharing uh, what, um, also look at the evidence, uh, as well as also the credibility generally um, using your intuition of uh, uh, where the information is coming from. Um, but more importantly, as media, I think gatekeepers of the society, um, oftentimes uh, where information is not enough, um, it has to be managed and delivered uh, very carefully. Um, of course, even where information is enough, uh, it also has to be managed carefully because it, it can have um, an equal result if it's not delivered in a context that makes sense. Um, alongside uh, that as well, um, of course, we've seen some interesting things done uh, as a country. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the, uh, an agency called the National Security Advisors Office lead the development of a document called the National Cybersecurity Act. Mm. Uh, even within the act, uh, we see a lot of references to, to really protection of, of our, our entire cyberspace um, against uh, fake news and misinformation. Um, so these are some of the things we can do. Um, but again, like I said, it's always stop, don't click, don't share, verify the information first. And even if you click, don't share until you're 100% sure of what you're, what you're looking at. And at a community level, um, oftentimes you find that this information is shared within the context of um, either ethnic or religious bigotry. Um, so you have to recognize that that also exists in your environment if it does. Uh, so if it does, you have to be very cautious of what you share as well. All right. Thank you so, so much to my guests who have done extremely well um, in giving us some context to uh, the issue of fake news in Nigeria. I'd like to say a big thank you to Belsuk. Thank, you, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. Um, Ahmed, thank you so much. Uh, and Chini. thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you've been listening to... Nim Capsule. I was going to say Nim FM. <laughs> Maybe listening to Nim Capsule uh, podcast. We are getting there. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nim Capsule um, podcast. Uh, my name remains Adi Doing Betiko. Um, s please join us again next time as we'll be discussing more on other topical issues affecting us in Nigeria. Uh, for me, for now, bye. Bye. Right. Take care.